Okay, so uh, today is the uh, 31st of uh, January uh, 2022, and we'll talk about two architects. We'll begin uh, with um, E. Faye Jones. I should have uh, I should have uh, amplified the, the first name, but that, that's this is how <clears throat> this is how he is known as E. Dart Faye Jones. He actually has a, a difficult first name and a little bit exotic. And unfortunately, I don't have it here. I should have had it here. But as I said, this uh, presentation has uh, certain deficiencies. And this is maybe the smallest of them. Let's read a little bit about him. Ah, here it is, his first name, which I cannot even pronounce. But you see it, and you can pronounce it for yourselves. So Faye Jones was born on, on January 31st, um, uh, 1921. So 101 years ago and died in 2004, was an American architect and designer, an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright during his professional career. Jones was the only one of Wright's disciples to have received the AIA gold medal in, 19, in 1990 the highest honor awarded by the American Institute of Architects. He also achieved international preeminence as an architectural educator during his 35 years of teaching at the University of Arkansas School of Architecture. His uh, Thorn Crown Chapel was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2000, only 20 years after it was built in re recognition of its architectural significance, and we are going to see it. It also received a 25-year award from the American Institute of Architects, another professional uh, recognition. So again, uh, E. Faye Jones was born on January 31st, 1921, meaning 101 years ago. Um, here was, is the man, was the man, um, and uh, behind him is that uh, chapel that was mentioned, which was uh, awarded uh, uh, in, in, in many ways, and it is indeed a, a very good, uh, a very good building. Uh, this is a fragment of, a, of, a, of one of his buildings, and I took it kind of a symbolic for his work. Uh, a, a, a good architect, a very good architect, and uh, the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright is obvious in many of his uh, houses. But uh, as Frank Lloyd Wright himself said when he visited him, uh, as opposed to Frank Lloyd Wright, who was rather obsessed by horizontality, in Faye Jones, there appears to be a, a certain longing for verticality. Although, when he did build horizontally, he was even more so-called horizontal than Frank Lloyd Wright. The, there are almost radical buildings, radically horizontal in his oeuvre, and we are going to see a few. This is a short presentation. Maybe next year uh, I will amplify it, but for now it's an introduction to the work of this architect who at least here in, uh, in, in Southeast uh, Europe uh, is less known. Uh, again, this is the man. This was the man, Faye Jones. And uh, was he a hero? I don't know, maybe to an extent. Um, I, I don't know him very well. I, I, uh, I, I like him even, you know, the way he looked uh, more in his later years than in his uh, uh, earlier years. But I think he was a serious man, and uh, I think he was also, um, I think he aspired, he longed for some kind of a spiritual architecture, at least in his, uh, but not only in his um, so-called sacred spaces, in the chapels he built, in some cases also in his houses. But let's, let's look at some of them. We start with this uh, house from 1961 uh, called the Butterfly House in Arkansas, in Arkansas where he lived and he worked and he taught. 
Uh, you see, talking about horizontality, I don't know if Frank Lloyd Wright saw this house, but uh, hardly you can say that this house is vertical, is, you know, almost, uh, you know, uh, excessively horizontal. It's a good building and, uh, um, you know, uh, I mean, the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright is there, but there are differences. I like very much this view. You know, it's almost like, a, you could almost say it's almost a church. You know, it could be a church, but it's a house, it's a house. And, but the skill of Faye Jones is obvious in, in just in this first picture that we looked at. Uh, look at the entrance here into the, into the building, you know, at. Uh, 45 degrees and uh, the duality is that uh, it's dynamic, it's interesting, it's uh, engaging. In some works, the, the influence of uh, his, uh, of, of, of Frank Lloyd Wright is um, uh, even more obvious than, than, it, than it is here. He actually built many houses. I, I, I could have added at least 10, 15 more houses to this presentation. I only show a few. This one from 1962, uh, again, uh, horizontal and uh, the power of the roof is again for all to see. The roof is, is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, protecting, uh, uh, you know, almost with the excessive, uh, uh, you know, devotion, what is underneath it. But I, I like it. And uh, there is a simplicity of the architectural language, which, uh, um, uh, you know, makes, makes this house and in, in some of his architecture uh, somehow more radical than, than what uh, Frank Lloyd Wright did. Uh, another one from 1963. So again, this is Faye Jones, a North American architect who is valued for some of his uh, uh, creations. This is also interesting. Now here we do see, you know, we do see verticality uh, and uh, we'll see a drawing. The drawing is not so dramatic as the, as the building in its actuality. Uh, you see this base here with stone. I think he was at his best when he assumed uh, organic natural materials in the rawness. Um, and look at, look at this interior, you know, I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright also brought the big rocks inside the living room at the falling water uh, in the woods of Pennsylvania. But these men, went even further. I mean, look at these walls, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, they, they, you are almost like in a cave. It's just the floor and the ceiling, which has, uh, which have, you know, a certain, uh, you know, so-called clean horizontality, but otherwise there is a lot of uh, drama. There are, there are big, big rocks here inside this, um, this uh, living room. Otherwise, uh, you know, the kitchen is, uh, you know, is rather small actually for, uh, you know, the, the, the big house that, that we are handling. Actually, it's not so big. It's, 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 it's more vertical. Uh, I don't like, and this, this puzzles me. This man understood stone, understood the rock, but inside the, his buildings, Wood is used uh, like here, you don't know, is this uh, some kind, is it natural wood or is, it's so smooth and so, it's something, something wrong about it. But I don't know, I, I mean, you know, look, this is a man of contrast. He accepts roughness and rawness at this dramatic level on the walls, but then he domesticates wood and it's almost like uh, covered with formica or something. You know, it, it's strange because 
I don't understand. On the floor is a little better, but um, the pieces of furniture where he uses wood, and I, I like to imagine that it is wood, uh, they, it, they almost look like it's, um, including in his own house, will make uh, the, the last house that I show is his own house, which his daughters after his death donated to the University of Arkansas, where the dad uh, taught. Uh, another residence from 1964, again, resolute uh, uh, horizontality, uh, clear cut uh, uh, roofing uh, from, uh, from left to right, interesting, uh, you know, uh, ornamental pieces uh, in a way in the garden, uh, clearly influenced by um, Asia, by the Orient, just as Frank Lloyd Wright himself was uh, influenced by uh, the Japanese culture whom, whom he liked, uh, which he liked a lot. Uh, and uh, it's, it seems that the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright on Faye Jones was, uh, was, uh, uh, was strong, was powerful, but his best works are actually uh, uh, original and uh, interesting. We, are going to, we didn't yet arrive at the best. From 1965, another, another house. Look again, you know, this is uh, actually, it's, it moves me. This, uh, this uh, dominance of the roof over the house. You know, the house is totally dominated by the roof. It is as if the roof, it is, it is as if the roof uh, tells the house, you must, you must uh, be subdued. You must, you must submit to gravity and to the earth. And I am protecting you from above and just stay there, stay there almost hidden. It's almost hidden underneath this uh, totalitarian, uh, totalitarian roof. Interesting, interesting conception. And again, I think Faye Jones deserves uh, more study. He was an, an architect who did have something to say, and he did say it. Now another house, he built many, some, some less interesting. I only show some that I thought are a little bit uh, worthy of being shown. This, is, this one I like uh, exactly because it's, it's, it's um, because of its verticality and it's similar to his famous chapel, which was considered uh, very, very highly, is considered very, very highly in the United States. I, I saw some, um, I think, uh, some organizations or institutions, maybe AIA, the American Institute of Architecture or Architects, um, considers it to be the fourth most important American building of the 20th century, if you can believe it. Here we see in the foreground the uh, Kandinsky, the Vasily chair by Marcel Breuer. Um, <laughs> I had two of these myself. I lost them. I brought them to Romania. I found them on the street in, uh, in a suburb of Chicago. Somebody discarded them. They were genuine, but um, you know, there were many editions of this famous chair. So I don't know where they were made, but with leather, I, I, I think either, I don't know. They disappeared from the, the attic where I put them. Um, in, in my hometown uh, in Sibiu. Anyway, uh, look at this house. You know, how would you feel inside this living room? I mean, if you would have removed the domestic furniture, this could have been easily a chapel. And in fact, we are going to see a chapel which is, uh, if not identical, very close to what we are looking at here. I like this house, you know, it's, uh, now, if, if the first churches were born from, uh, you know, essentially from a house, the oldest church at the beginning, the small church was actually a house with a cross above it or, you know, and now we see the, the opposite. So the first church was born from a, from a house. Here we have a house is aspiring to become a church or church-like. I, I, think, I think this architect, Faye, Faye Jones, 
was uh, was a believer in in a in a I mean you know in a very devotional way. This is my feeling, considering his architecture. Uh, a good building, this one, no question, and different from uh, very different from. Uh, this one very different from, um, let's say, falling water by right and so on. Now another house, 1981. So we are more than 10 years later, almost 15 years later, but you see the roof is still the first violin, so to speak. It, uh, it uh, dictates the aesthetics of the, of the building. And I think, I actually think, you know, actually the mo modernity of the building is clear and the sculpturalness, but I also think it functions well because, uh, you know, uh, this, this building is uh, truly protecting. You can tell that this building uh, does not have problems to handle rain, you know, and I, I think the roofs of Faye Jones are better done even aesthetically than those of Frank Lloyd Wright. I always had some, had some doubts. I don't know. I think he uses slate here, which is a stone. And the um, problem with the roofs is true. I uh, was spoiled by my uh, uh, childhood and upbringing in Sibiu and all the, you know, let's say with a medieval side to it. And, you know, I, I, I used to see Tsigle meaning ceramic tiles uh, everywhere. But in the United States, those are not very common and they use all kinds of uh, other materials. And Frank Lloyd Wright himself, in my opinion, very rarely actually created convincing roofs, not in terms of geometry or architectural composition, but in terms of the material he used. I see that Faye Jones, he seems to, I don't know, I, what I look at here seems convincing uh, aesthetically. And uh, I think he used uh, the proper materials for the sloping planes of the, of, the, of the roof. Now, we arrive at that famous chapel, the Thorn Crown Chapel. So let's remember this because it's a very fine building. Thorn Crown Chapel constructing, constructed using over 6,000 square feet of glass. The church has 425 windows. Can you believe it? And it's not such a big building. 425 windows. The chapel is fourth in AIA's list of top buildings of the 20th century. That's what I said a few minutes ago. Now to be the fourth on um, the American Institute of Architecture uh, list of top buildings of the 20th century. This is not a little thing because there are many important buildings built in the 20th century in the United States. Uh, it has received a special 25 year award of excellence. We read about this located in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. The chapel was constructed in 1980 with a res resemblance to Gothic cathedrals due to its verticality, the chapel peacefully rests among the trees and appears to have grown from the site in the Ozarks. I guess that's the, the, the area where it was built. This is a drawing of the chapel that he made, clearly influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, I'm not very fond of the drawing. Yes, it's a fine drawing, uh, manually constructed uh, perspective. The building actually is better than, uh, than what the drawing shows here. Uh, a peculiarity of the drawings of Frank Lloyd Wright, and I see it repeated here by Faye Jones, is that very often Frank Lloyd Wright limits the uh, expansion of the sky at the top of the drawing with a, with a frame. With this line, you see, this line does not exist at the bottom. It only exists, or most of the time, it exists at the top for Frank Lloyd Wright. And I was wondering why. Uh, and uh, I have my own, uh, you know, speculative thoughts about this. It seems that Frank Lloyd Wright was more at, at, 
at home, so to speak, with the earth, and we know how much he valued the earth. And maybe he 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 thought of the uh, limiting somehow, uh, you know the. I know maybe the words, my words are not the best, but to limit a little bit, uh, you know, the infinity of the sky, to to restrict it almost, to to underline the the belonging to the earth of the building in this way as well. I don't know, but let's look at the building. First uh, view from the top is not a big, it's a plan. Yeah, it's not a big building. Uh, so the comparison with the Gothic cathedral can only go so far. I don't know if he did this drawing. I don't think he did. I imagine this is a newer, newer drawing, but forget the drawing. Well, we'll look also at the uh, sections and elevations. I don't think I don't know if he did these drawings or not, but the building is much better than these uh, diagrammatic, um, you know, sketches. Uh, here is a longitudinal section, and there are already interesting things here. You know, uh, if you look on the left and on the right, uh, what are these things? Uh, you'll see when when I show pictures of the building uh, what they are. But even like this, the longitudinal section is uh, rather mysterious in its, uh, you know, rectangularity and uh, you would say even rationalism. And here are some views, um, but we will see better ones than this one. Um, it's a good building. It is a good building, and. Uh, Maybe if all those trees didn't exist around it, it would have been maybe less good. But those trees bring in um, the, the, lyricism, uh, the, the lyricism of green. And so it's, it's this conjunction between the geometry of the building and the, the impressionistic movement of the leaves, uh, the foliage of the tree, the slender trees, they, they, it's a good, it's a good marriage, so to speak. Um, so again, you know, it, it's a chapel which this one I, I, I would say has nothing to do with Frank Lloyd Wright or almost nothing, uh, and um, is uh, is uh, distinctly distinctly belongs to to Faye Jones, <clears throat> and uh, I think it functions very well for the for the purpose it was built being a, a chapel. I think it deserves, yes, to be on that list with the best uh, buildings uh, of the 20th century. <clears throat> Even today, if uh, <clears throat> I imagine uh, Ken Gokuma would, uh, would uh, respect and admire this building, but you cannot bet on it because architects like other artists uh, and uh, not only artists uh, can also be, uh, you know, capricious and uh, even envious. It's a good building. It is a good building, uh, both uh, from the outside and from the inside. <clears throat> I'm not so sure about these benches, um, but maybe yes, maybe why not? I don't know. I I don't know. But what is above this um, <clears throat> fractal? Uh, roofing is, I think, uh, very interesting. And he employs something similar uh, for a pavilion, which we are going to see, uh, which uh, made one uh, use the word ethereal, ethereal uh, pavilion. Interesting also this uh, lighting system with a cross, uh, uh, you know, incorporated into it and slender, you know, kind of like uh, for uh, characters, human characters descending or descended from a painting by El Greco into the chapel. Uh, uh, Faye Jones was notorious for, uh, uh, you know, uh, building only a few buildings a year because he wanted to design everything and he wanted to be very scrupulous and indeed he was. So the idea to, to create a, you know, a modern Gothic lamp uh, is, is a good one. And I think he did a good job even with these lamps. Uh, so, you know, it was a whole work of art. 
I don't know again about the benches. I, I think they, they are a little bit uh, too prosaic for my taste, uh, but not to speak about the color. Uh, maybe he tried to match with, uh, with this color, um, you know, those uh, books, uh, the Bible probably, I'm joking, maybe not the best joke of my life, but um, no, the, with the exception of the benches, I think the building is very luminous, it's structured, it's uh, geometrically coherent, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting work. And, and, uh, and uh, as you look up, uh, upwards, it becomes symphonic. Uh, yes, in an organized way, but not in an oppressive way. So uh, it, it is a good building. Uh, it doesn't matter how you look at it in the winter or at night or during the day. It's still a, a fine, a fine chapel. And I think any religion or uh, any 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 kind of person from with any kind of faith would appreciate it. This could have been also, a, you know, a, a Shinto temple or a. You know, it could have been in Japan a chapel for not necessarily Christianity. I mean, you know, regardless of those, not considering those lamps, it's an abstract artwork, architectural work, and uh, I think it transcends uh, the denomination of a specific, uh, uh, of a specific uh, religion. Fay Jones, E. Fay Jones. Now we look at another house called the Butterfly House uh, from 1961. Uh, no, I wish, or I already showed it. I think I did at the beginning because I, I made a mistake. Uh, uh, some of his houses have two names, the name of the, the owner and then uh, you know, a symbolic name, like in this case, the Butterfly House. Uh, anyway, sorry about this. This shouldn't be here. Uh, now, another chapel by Faye Jones. Uh, let's read a little bit about it. It was constructed in 1988, so it's newer than the previous one, eight years um, uh, younger. Also built in Arkansas, Jones' second major project for a chapel. It has a similar Gothic character as the Thorn Crown Chapel, owing to its verticality and progression of frames. Larger than the Thorn Crown Chapel, the Cooper Chapel measures 24 feet wide. 24 feet wide is, you know, is seven, about seven meters wide. It's not, it's not a big building. By 84 feet long and rises 54 feet to its skylighted peak, protected by a wood, wooded hill and overlooking a lake. The wood and steel framed arch structure resting on a low stone foundation welcomes the visitor. The entrance to the chapel is framed by a tall pointed arch opening. With flagstone flooring and pointed arch oak doors, the chapel has a rectangular plan with glass walls that enclose ductwork for heating, the cooling system held in place between steel and wood column set at six foot intervals. The, the round unglazed window just above the point of the arch is symbolic of the Gothic rose window. The customized foot lamps alongside, along the hillside pathway leading to the chapel were designed by Jones himself. And this is the building. I don't know if I have a picture from, uh, uh, from the outside. Uh, Actually, from the outside, it doesn't look so convincing, but from the inside, I like this. This uh, again, you know, it, it is uh, the reference to the Gothic is, uh, you know, easy to see uh, the Ogival Arch, but it's not done in a, in a, in a you know, uh, tired, uh, mimicking way. No, it, it has. Uh, has the power of originality and creativity, and I think he absorbed the Gothic uh, rather well. And, and I like the fact that the structure is ornamental and the ornament is structural. So there is the conjunction between structure and ornament. And I think uh, this is something uh, worth, uh, 
worth uh, doing uh, all the time, actually, in architecture, especially in those places which do not even pronounce the word uh, ornament. So another, I would say, good work by, uh, by Faye Jones, if we are a little bit, uh, you know, tolerant about the benches, maybe what bothers me about the benches, although it's probably very cozy to sit on them because they are soft, and I'm just not sure if, uh, you know, we should pay so much attention to the certain part of our body when we are in a chapel or a church. I don't know. I, I didn't see too many. In fact, I don't remember seeing another church with so much concern, functional concern, you know, for, again, for a certain part of, of, of the body of the believer. It's something about it, a little bit funny, you know. You, 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 you sit on this soft cushion, you know, in front of God. I mean, the house of God is, you know, the church or the chapel and the uh, but maybe maybe I, 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 I shouldn't think like this. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think personally, I think a certain austerity is necessary. After all, you know, do you have to, you know, feel on, on the bench in the chapel like you feel at home on the sofa? I don't think so. Anyway, but what is above is uh, interesting. And uh, again, I think uh, this marriage between structure and ornament is uh, is what makes the work uh, uh, good also the 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 abstraction of of the gothic the bringing the gothic to to your time at uh, the end of the 20th century now we see also uh, an architectural work by faith jones where he inspired one to call it the ethereal uh, building or the ethereal ethereal uh, roofing and here it is, uh, you know, it's a pavilion. I don't know exactly what its function is, but again, this, this scene could have been very well seen in Japan, uh, but no, it's in the United States. Where is it in, uh, it doesn't say, maybe in Arkansas, or uh, it is in the United States. And in this particular view, uh, I think uh, we, we, we all agree it is, uh, a sensitive work. Uh, it's not a chapel, but it could have been a chapel. Well, it's also situated in a beautiful landscape, you know, with the lake and the, the, the narrow, uh, you know, almost delicate trunks of the trees. Uh, this is a, I don't know if it's not a digital uh, representation of the structure. It is. It is. It is. Maybe it is. Maybe it is not. The, the, here is the building. Um, yeah. Faye Jones was good at this sort of thing. But we saw he was also good at uh, designing those uh, close to Earth horizontal long, long buildings. Monumental, monumental somehow in their uh, persistent horizontality. Interesting pavilion, you see, Pine Coat Pavilion by architect E. Faye Jones. Now, I like very much this picture. And you see on the left corner, architect E. Faye Jones. But I couldn't find more information about this building. It might be that it, it is his own house. And I'm going to end this presentation soon with his own house, but I, I couldn't verify. I couldn't see other parts of the, of the house. So I'm not sure, was this his own house, a wing of his own house? Uh, I'm still uh, um, uh, asking this question because uh, uh, by today I was not able to find out. Uh, this we saw, and now we, we I end this uh, rather short presentation on Faye Jones with his own house in Arkansas, which his daughters 
donated to the, the University of Arkansas, where their father taught for 35 years. They donated the house. And it's something said about, no, no, the act of donation is not said. But the house, without life in it, with, without anyone living in it, looks, uh, anyway, you'll see how it looks. The tree is fine. <laughs> The tree is always fine, and but the, and 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 from this view, the house looks looks okay, and it's not just the house. Even this, I don't know what it is here, but it's it's very finely crafted. Maybe some kind of a lighting system, sculpturally, but it's it's woven, it's it's embroidered in wood. It's it's very nice. And the, the whole site is, is, is romantic with these trees and so on. But the building, let's look at it. I also like the fact that he brings the stone in, uh, as uh, sometimes uh, Frank Lloyd Wright did, uh, particularly at uh, the falling water. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> this was also done by Bruce Goff, another you know, uh, branch, so to speak. But no, 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 I shouldn't use such words because Brisgoff actually turned his back <clears throat> on uh, on Frank Lloyd Wright. But they are all part of the same circle in a way. Frank Lloyd Wright, Brisgoff, uh, Faye Jones, uh, and others. You know, courageous enough to 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 love nature even in this extreme form in which they bring uh, or, or they use the, 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 the presence of giant uh, rocks uh, to incorporate them in the anatomy of the building. Now, this picture was supposed to be towards the end. It landed here. Uh, I don't know what this apparatus is. Um, I have another picture with it, I think, was some kind of a scanner because I understood uh, they, the University of Arkansas, the Faculty of uh, Architecture, they, um, they uh, created also, uh, you know, the, the virtual images and maybe plans and sections of the building. What I don't like, and I, I, I see it again, for my, me personally, the way he treated wood is, um, to me, is too smooth and too, it, it almost looks fake. And I'm surprised. I mean, is this the same architect? Here, it's wood. It's fine. But uh, here, it's, it's too smooth. I know in the United States, they have great uh, mimicking wood. You know, wood, which is not wood, mimicking being wood. And it, it kind of looks like this, veneered. It's a veneered wood, and, and uh, I, I, it agitates me to imagine that this is what this architect used here. Because it's cheap, it's, um, but it's cheap not just in terms of money. I'm sure Faye Jones had enough money to use real wood. Although, on the other hand, using real wood means cutting down some trees. But at that time, you know, people were not so concerned. You look, you look even here. This is dramatic with this stone, and then this is, yeah, it looks like veneer wood, and I just don't believe it. It's, uh, uh, yes, there is misery on the floor because the building we clearly was, uh, you know, the daughters removed all the things that belonged to them, and uh, the building was donated as a building. Um, this is the apparatus that they used, like, oh, wow, this is. Um, you know, uh, big name in in, uh, in in the field of uh, lenses. Uh, uh, it's possible some kind of an apparatus that scans and you. I, I don't know. I never saw one like this. I never worked. With, it's a laser thing. Uh, anyway, here are prob probably these are the daughters, or maybe these are two students from the Arkansas University Faculty of Architecture. It's possible. Anyway, the building had qualities, with the exception of, for me personally, of the way he treated wood inside. I think it, it was a very nice building. Even this uh, rather adventurous uh, ceiling uh, outside, painted in red, uh, I, I don't mind it, you know. Um, anyway, 
But it's sad, all in all, it's a deserted building. And uh, I like the floor, I like the walls, I like uh, maybe even the ceiling to an extent. This I don't like because of the veneer wood. This, I hope it's not, but I think that's what it is. It's veneer, uh, you know, prefabricated pressed wood. And, uh, you know, it's like the difference between a suit made of uh, cotton and uh, wool and the suit made of polyester. It's, it's like this. This is like uh, the equivalent of polyester. It bothers me. <laughs> I really, it bothers me. I, I don't understand how, how Faye Jones could, could do something like this in his house. Uh, uh, here, it's, it's fine, you know, but uh, anyway. Look, look at the authenticity of this, even if, uh, okay, a little bit damaged, it doesn't matter, it's authentic. But here, it's, it's suspiciously undamaged by time, you know, it's, it's... anyway. Uh, is this the kitchen? If it is, it's uh, deadly narrow. I mean, for a house that uh, is in the woods with no neighbors to see, I still don't believe it is the kitchen of, uh, you know, so narrow, you know, and, and dark there in the corner, almost ominous. But anyway, maybe it's not the kitchen, but what else could it be? Anyway, uh, some lamps. We know he liked doing lamps, and I think we arrive now at the last image of this rather imperfect and short presentation. Yes, with another lamp. And now we can look at, I still don't know, I still don't know if this is real wood and treated uh, excessively towards a uh, uh, real smoothness or, uh, or uh, I better not think about it. Now we go to the second architect, a very important architect uh, uh, in Italy and in the world, Filippo Giovara. Filippo Giovara, uh, who lived in the 17th and the, uh, 18th century, and uh, he died today. He was not born like Faye Jones, but he died on the 31st of January, and this is why we talk about him today. So let's, uh, let's uh, see what uh, Filippo Juvara is telling us uh, about architecture. So he was, he was living you know, uh, he was uh, belonging to the Baroque or late Renaissance Baroque, uh, rather Baroque. This was the man uh, <laughs> with a rather jolly uh, face. Uh, look at his uh, little finger, uh, you know, <laughs> rather delicious, uh, you know, with a, a little ring on it. And, uh, you know, he's so skillful at drawing that he doesn't even have to look at the drawing when he draws. He looks at us. I'm joking. Of course, he knows. He knows we are staring at him. And uh, I wonder how he would have looked like without that, um, that wig. Uh, okay, Filippo Juvara. Let's read. Filippo Juvara. Uh, born the 7th of March in 1678 and died uh, on the 31st of January 1736. So he died when he was 58, 58 uh, years old. Uh, was an Italian architect active in a late Baroque. Uh, I placed him a little bit wrongly. I don't know why. Maybe because of the presentation I previously made, not about Faye Jones, but uh, one or two days uh, earlier. Uh, yes, uh, it was already emancipated from the Renaissance. So late Baroque style who worked primarily in Italy, Spain, and Portugal. Juvara was born in Messina, Sicily, to a family of goldsmiths and engravers. After spending his formative years with his family in Sicily, where he designed Messina's festive settings for the coronation of Philip V of Spain and Sicily, Juvara moved to Rome in 1704. There he studied architecture with Carlo and Francesco Fontana. Uh, important name, Carlo Fontana. So again, he was born in Sicily. Uh, he's a late uh, Baroque architect 
and now let's look at some drawings. Uh, very interested in theater, like other architects from that time. The Baroque in general loved the theater. He loved the theater too. He designed, uh, you know, settings uh, for theater plays, uh, costumes, uh, choreograph, perhaps even maybe I don't know. But you see, there is a lot of interest in in the theater. Spectacolo uh, del teatro. Anyway, I can't read very well, but. It's about theater, theater again. Um, he drew very well, of course, all these architects from that time, uh, you know, were mastering uh, manual drawing very, very well. You couldn't survive as an architect if you didn't draw well. A little bit of an influence from Piranesi. Well, I don't know. Piranesi was born in 1720, so he anticipated the arrival of Piranesi. When he died, Piranesi, I think, was 16. If he died in 1736, I, I forgot, 1736. Piranesi lived between 1720 and 1778. Uh, now, I actually have a different perception of Piranesi because Juvara lived a little bit earlier, before Piranesi. They were contemporary for a, a few years when Piranesi was still a child. Anyway, uh, Filippo Juvara, drawings from the Roman period, where he went to Rome to study. Uh, of course, everybody went to Rome. Palladio went to Rome. All roads led to Rome, now the eternal city. You had to go to Rome. You learned architecture by going to Rome. If you didn't go to Rome, even in modern times, uh, Louis Kahn, Louis Kahn would not have become Louis Kahn if he didn't go to Rome. Louis Kahn had a fellowship of the American Institute Academy in Rome and spent at least a year in Rome, if not two years, I, I'm not sure, one or two years. And they were extremely important for Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn left the United States as a modern architect. He returned from Rome, still a modern architect, but a very original modern architect, highly impressed and, and moved by what Rome offered. So, uh, yeah, Rome is Rome. What can I say? Still is. There was a pleasure of invention here, you know, and this, this I try to evoke as much as I can. If we could somehow, I'm talking about us, if we could bring into our work this pleasure of, of invention, you know, of this desire to change the world, to make it better, to make it maybe a dreamlike or utopian. It's not a divorce, divorce from, from, from the world. It's, I actually think, I know some people think art is a, an escape from reality. In my opinion, best art is not an escape from reality, it's actually an intensification of reality. Good art intensifies life and reality. It doesn't turn its back. Yes, there is that aspect. Uh, uh, somehow you have a feeling that uh, great artwork is is too distant from what we call the real. But in my opinion, the best art is amplifying and intensifying life and reality. It's not turning its back from it. This is what I'm tempted to say. Um, but a level of idealization is important, I think. And I totally agree with, with, with uh, Stephen Hall. The soul needs the ideal more than the real. I'm talking about the soul, not the brain. The brain probably uh, made uh, Faye Jones uh, decide to put that uh, cushion thing uh, on, the, on the benches. Maybe the heart uh, would have done differently. You know, the brain is, 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 is the, 
I don't I don't know. I think I think we cannot brainstorm. Although the word is clear, brainstorm. Nobody would say heart storm, but in my opinion, it is the heart that storms, not their brain. The tumultuousness of the of the soul is a reality. The heart boils. The heart because it's the locus of emotions. It's not the brain. It's the heart. But we, as uh, citizens of the world in the 21st century, are obsessed by the brain. We believe so much in the brain. We think that, I mean, even the word concept, the heart doesn't care about concepts. It's the brain that works with concepts, not the heart. But we don't cooperate with the heart any longer, uh, or not sufficiently. Anyway, Jovara drew, 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 but he also built, and we are going to see uh, some of Jovara's uh, buildings because he built a lot. He drew a lot. He was a man of passion, of course, like all Sicilians. From Sicily, what do you expect? They are poor, but they have great hearts and great temperaments. I mean, uh, <laughs> I should not remember how I bought a brick uh, with one hundred dollars in Napoli. Yes, I was in Napoli and I bought a ticket. I wanted to fly to New York to see someone, and uh, I I had some hours to to kill, so to speak, in Napoli. And I took a walk through the city, and here came to me an older man, older than me, and he said, uh, "Do you want to buy a Sony camera?" And I said, "No, go away. I don't buy technology from the street." He said, no, 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 you don't know. This is a great deal. It's a brand new, the latest model of Sony. You know, just look at it. And he he took out this camera very, I never had I until then a video camera. So he took this video camera. This was, I don't know, almost 20 years ago. And he said, look, look, you can film with it. And so I said, okay, in the end, I gave in. I said, it was seductive, you know, it was a beautiful, you know, engine, beautifully engineered the uh, video camera, of course, in Japan. And um, actually, I, 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 uh, I uh, you know, I discussed with him about the price. I was able to, he asked for 200 at first. I was able to reduce to the price to 100. I said, okay, I'll buy it for my daughter, a present from Napoli, from Sicily, from, well, close to Sicily. And, uh, and, uh, I bought it, and after I bought it, the man put the video camera in a bag, and and then disappeared. And then I became a little bit afraid. I said, "What, what if uh, the man stole it, and then some people come in and you know beat me, and who knows, something bad could happen?" So I left. And then when I arrived at the park, I sat on a bench. I said, "Let me look at my acquisition. You know, one hundred dollars was not so little, and uh, I never bought something like this on the street." So I opened the bag. It was um, the so-called video camera was covered in a, in a newspaper. And <laughs> when I removed the newspaper, it was a brick, a brick. I bought a brick with $100 uh, dollars from, uh, from Napoli. Uh, well, not literally Sicily, but uh, across the world. Uh, anyway. Uh, back to uh, the architect we are talking about today. Uh, Basilica of Superga, Superga from 1731, so early 18th century, one of Juvara's masterworks. Juvara was a very important architect. Uh, you know, he was active in the 18th century, but born in the 17th. One of Juvara's masterworks, the Basilica Church of Superga, was built in 1731 and rises at the top of a mountain overlooking the city of Turin. It was part picturesque monument and part royal mausoleum for the family, family of Savoy, Savoy, Savoy. Reputedly, the site was chosen because of a vow taken here by the then Duke and the future King Victor Amadeus II, as he surveyed the field of operations while defending the city from the besieging French armies during the Battle of Turin. 
construction was arduous and took over 14 years because it was on top of a hill, almost mountain. You see it, including two years to flatten the mountain top. So you see, it's not just the Chinese who flatten mountain tops and even mountains altogether. They did it in the 18th century Italy as well and other places, of course. And that incredible cost and effort to bring the stones and supplies to the peak. Behind the church was a monastery. The classical portico is appended to a centralized church with a highly vertical 75 meter baroque dome. The letter creates a mountain atop a mountain effect. So it's a mountain atop a mountain, exactly what Frank Lloyd Wright uh, plainly said that one should not do. He, he was very firm about this, that we should not build a mountain on top of a mountain, meaning to add to the height of the natural mountain to our own building. But this is what he did. Juvara did this. Uh, and uh, I don't know why it's considered so highly. It doesn't move me so much. Yes, the interior, but I would have preferred it was inside the city, not on top of a hill. And I'm saying this not because of what uh, Frank Lloyd Wright said. It's just that, I don't know, it is a little bit arrogant you now to be like this on top of a mountain. You know, it's, it's, um, it's overdoing it, in overcooking it, so to speak. Over, yeah, look at this, you know, the triumph of man over the mountain. It's just, uh, I don't know, I have a feeling it's a little bit in bad taste, but uh, sorry, Jubara, I have uh, high respect for you, but it's something, something about it. You know? I mean, building on top of the triumph of God, your, you know, human triumph is too much. Plus, this, um, and he does it in some other places, this portico with these uh, classical columns. The buildings are, I guess, are, is okay, but uh, what's going on here is a little bit, um, it's uh, almost neoclassical. And uh, this is crushing the mountain. I mean, it's huge, you know, it's, I, I don't know. And it's in a different spirit from, 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 from what we see here, is it not? I think it is. I, I, I don't know what to see. I, I, it's not one of my preferred uh, realizations of, of, of this architect. You can imagine when I read that, uh, you know, it took a long time and just to bring the stones then the construction materials, you can imagine, you know, to bring everything there. I wish I was not one of those workers who built this thing. It's almost frightening, actually, this, uh, you know, distancing from its uh, celestial position uh, in relation with everything around. It, it's, maybe it's impressive when you are there, but maybe it's too impressive. I don't know. Um, it depends how you look at it. Maybe the, the builder and the client thought that, uh, you know, this was a great uh, act of faith, uh, you know, to, to make this great effort to build like this there on top of the mountain. Uh, it was well described to build a mountain on top of a mountain. Juvara, Filippo Juvara. Otherwise, yes, the building respects the canons, you uh, know, properly. The circle is a circle, the dome is a dome. Uh, it's a good, it's a good building inside. I wish it was somewhere in Rome or Turin. Now you see these benches. I wish uh, Faye Jones had something similar to these benches, not those, you know, uh, hyper uh, comfortable uh, benches in, in his chapel. Otherwise a fine building, yes. Juvara, Juvara, you worked for 14 years to build this thing here on top of the mountain. Now Santa Cristina, the facade in Turin, uh, this building I like, 
and um, yeah, you are going to see it's an actually I'm a little bit confused because there are two. This one is Santa Cristina, but a little bit later, I think, was built one that identical. You know, they are twins. Uh, this is Santa Cristina, and I think inside Santa Cristina is a very famous sculptural work by none other than Ber Bernini, the Ecstasy of Saint Teresa. So this is uh, this is the it's a fine building, and the, uh, the you know the the facade by Juvara, I, I think is 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 convincing. In fact, it convinced me to place this work on the the invitation I sent out to adoring uh, adoring fans of these presentations hello uh, santa cristina yes santa cristina uh, i don't know about this how it is called it's hard to differentiate this one doesn't have the sculptures otherwise the building is identical or almost identical we are going to see the ecstasy of Saint Teresa too. It's inside this building by the incredible um, Bernini, the, uh, the you know the rival of Borromini. Apparently, the the rivalry between Borromini and Bernini uh, made uh, Borromini uh, take his own life at 67 or 68. Some people think that that's why he committed suicide because he was depressed, because Bernini was more, much more uh, able in the field of you know public relations. He was a kind, uh, you know, seductive man, and Borromini was difficult. But I think the genius of Borromini was in no way smaller or less than the genius of Bernini. Here are drawings still by Juvara. Uh, And we look at these buildings, uh, their facades and the sculptures and so on, and then, you know, we return to our cubicle white buildings with flat walls, no sculptures, no, no nothing, no, you know, I don't know for how long we will continue like this, really. No wonder we have so many bored architects in the world. First, there are too many architects. Second, you know, those who build many times build boring buildings. So they themselves are bored. And uh, because, uh, you know, we remove the pleasure of doing architecture from architecture most of the time. The Palazzo Madama, the facade, it is a palazzo, right? We see the human uh, theater in front of the palazzo. Here it is. Where is it built? Is it in uh, Turin? Uh, maybe. He also built in Spain. Um, now, of course, here there is a tourist who is totally indifferent to the palazzo built by uh, Jubara. Uh, it's okay. Or maybe he already studied it, photographed it, uh, measured it. That's possible too. Is he was he a, a student in, in architecture? Maybe not, maybe just a tired uh, tourist or a homeless man. A palazzo, what can we say? A palazzo is always a palazzo, a palace. It looks good. And it has a, a staircase. Um, I, don't, I think he worked mainly on the, on the, the facade. Yeah, it's this staircase that, um, he, that's what he worked. I think the building behind this wall uh, existed or was not done by him. Filippo Juvara. A building for those who mattered at that time. Since then, of course, they are totally gone and totally forgotten. Just as sorry for sounding uh, morbid, but this will happen to us too. You know, we inflate our chests uh, 
uh, at times, but uh, one day will will vanish and. Uh, you know, 1,000 years from now, not to say 100 years from, from now, no one will, will ever remember that we existed. Unless, unless we build such a staircase and such a triumphal space, and then they will, they will remember. But then for whom do we build palaces? Not any longer. Now, the palace of Venaria with Amade Amedeo di Castellamonte, Michelangelo Garove, and Benedetto Alfieri. Sorry for uh, indulging in the pleasure of uh, reading imperfectly these Italian names. Uh, another, I would say, uh, you know, architectural uh, jewel from uh, Filippo Giubara. He didn't do the whole thing, he just... Uh... Now here I'm a little bit confused and when I made a presentation on him, I, I was equally confused and I didn't solve the dilemma because there are several buildings. I guess there are several buildings, some built by other architects. It wasn't very clear. Maybe looking at the windows and the doorways, um, this might be Juvara, but... Uh, I don't know, this usage of the bricks. It might be Juvara. The, this interior is, but I'm not sure about the, the exterior of that building. The castle of Rivoli, I will not read again the, the beautiful Italian names of this larger team of architects. Uh, this, this is ruined in, bon, in good measure. Uh, look at them, but even as ruins is still impressive. Um, I mean, Italy is full of uh, jewels, uh, as you as you know. You know, almost it doesn't matter if you look at left or you look at right, you see something of some architectural significance. Even, even if they don't keep all their buildings in very good shape, like the Germans do or other countries, they, they, they have so many uh, truces to, to, to take care of that. And I like the fact that, you know, there are some, I mean, you know, maybe the purists uh, would protest. But I like some, you know, newer interventions, even if they might, might appear irreverentious or irreverential. Uh, Ruins are impressive because a ruin is telling you how the building was made, but it's telling you also that time is passing on all of us. And uh, it's, it's about time. Maybe Vito Aconci was right. Architecture is not about space, it's about time. Now the church of San Filippo Neri in Turin, uh, I don't like this, uh, you know, this could have been also the New York Stock Exchange. I, I, I don't like these frontons, this almost neoclassical, uh, flat, uh, pompous, uh, but the building inside is fine and um, rather dramatic. I, I, I don't know, did he do this? Because it, it almost looks like if you, if you remove this part here, uh, you see a different building behind. This is, uh, it almost irritates me. Uh, I, I don't believe Jovara did this. I hope he didn't. But inside, look at this. It's, 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 it's an impressive uh, interior, an impressive church in Turin. And Turin has other impressive uh, buildings and churches and ah, they also have great uh, soccer teams. I don't know why the North Americans use this for soccer because it's ridiculous. Why don't they say football? North Americans are sometimes strange. But uh, Juvara was not strange when he designed this beautiful interior here because it is beautiful. Maybe some, a little bit too ornate for some people, but uh, he was late Baroque architect. 
It looks a little bit better here because it's not so whitish and cleaned up, just like Notre Dame de Paris, which also has a Western facade too clean and too white. Now the Church of Santa Croce, also in Turin or Torino, uh, this one is almost modern, modernistic somehow. It's, it's simpler, it's smaller, it's, um, it's simplified, yes. The interior, no, but um, and uh, the ellipse of the of the roof, uh, the ceiling is uh, a complication which. Uh, some people before the Baroque would not uh, get into, but the Baroque architects loved uh, the circle with two centers, if we are to call the ellipse so. I always like old pictures of buildings and not just of buildings, because again, it's about the passage of time. I think the building was destroyed, was uh, affected by the, by the war. The uh, magnificent, uh, splendid uh, Second World War. Let's hope uh, we are not going to have another war soon. Yellow, yellow tracing paper, I guess it existed in the, in the 18th century as well. So this is Juvara. Yes, yes, as I said, it was, um, it was bombed. It was affected by, by the war. Very sad. When will human beings understand that the war doesn't serve anyone? There are no winners actually in the war. Everybody loses. Now a castle, with Guarino Guarini, one of my preferred architects who also did a lot of work in Turin. Uh, I don't know exactly what he did here, Guarino Guarini. I, I don't think he worked on this. This is just uh, Italian Rococo because the late Baroque is, um, you know, uh, Rococo. Cast. What can you do? It's for. Uh, it's not for mortals. It's for uh, you know the upper strata of, of society. And now tourists, of course. Well, not any longer because of the pandemic. But maybe the pandemic will go away. Although, I'm reading alarming reports. France. How do you explain it? France has a high vaccination rate. And he has half a million, half a million new cases, almost half a million cases now for the third week every day of new cases. I counted in two weeks, France had five million people with new cases of COVID. This is unbelievable. Also, hundreds and hundreds of deaths, like three, four hundred. That's in every every day. It's, I don't know what to say about this. I'm, I'm, um, and it's the same with uh, Italy. France is the most dramatic, but uh, Italy and Spain and Great Britain is, is Chiesa Madonna del Carmine, Torino, Turin. Because of the Baroque uh, elements, I think the, the interior of the church is more, uh, I don't know, more, uh, I don't know how to say, I cannot say more pleasant because, you know, the interior of a church shouldn't be pleasant. But uh, I was thinking about the churches of Palladio and I love Palladio. I admire him and I love him. But somehow the interiors of his, of his churches, I'm not, I don't know why. I, 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 I'm tempted to think that he was not an ardent believer. 
if if I am to consider the interiors of his churches. But here the, you know, the, the accessories, so to speak, the Baroque touches um, create something. Uh, without them, the building would not have been what it is, I think. Late Baroque, but the building itself is not so heavily ornamented. There are just some sculptures and some you know, decorations. Look, thanks to the Second World War. And of course, it was not the only destruction. Palazzina di Caccia of Stupinigi. Uh, this is another palace um, playing with some angles here in, in plan. Um, Juvara, Filippo Juvara, and look at this, uh, you know, quite impressive. Um, ceiling. You know, these people worked at this ceiling uh, and in work similar to this one as if uh, it was, you know, the, you know, the culmination of their lives. And in a way it was maybe for some or maybe for many. Very ornate. Uh, Pictorially speaking, otherwise, towards the outside, the building is uh, a moderate baroque building, but not the inside. The inside is not moderate. So we are approaching the end of this presentation. Just bear with me a few more minutes. Uh, why did they? Why did Juvara place this thing here? You know, it's a deer. Um, I have seen it in other cases. Uh, a vigorous uh, site planning, so to speak, otherwise, because of the, you know, the the different angles that he uses is vigorous. It's a virile composition, but the decoration is uh, in a different spirit. And here you see the side plan with the geometry of the of the pass and the, you know, the park and the palace. It's it's a large palace for God's sake. I don't know exactly for whom it was built, but uh, it's quite large. Royal Palace, uh, La Grania de San, maybe in Spain or Portugal, because he built in Italy, in Spain, and in Portugal. Um, sorry about these pictures. Filippo Jubara, we see his love of theater in this building more than in some others. The Turks, then in, in Turkey, there is this saying that when the house is ready, here comes death. And I don't know. I mean, it is a you know a rather abrupt and, and brutal, but there is some truth here. You know, I mean, most people at that time, you know, they worked uh, you know to, for years and years to build a house, a building, and then you know we are all limited in this sense. And at that time, people lived uh, shorter than we live now. So. I mean, look just at uh, this uh, feature here, you know, is an artwork in itself. Now, this one is interesting, the Church of San Gregorio in Messina. I like this building. It's small, 
it's exquisite, it's exotic. Um, I think he was born in Messina, no? Uh, is Messina in Sicily? I think so. It's a very interesting building and very different. I mean, <clears throat> it is Baroque, <clears throat> but it, it, it has an exoticism which makes it um, stand out even though it's a small building. Look at this, it almost has something Russian about it, I think. I think this church would have, could have, could have been built uh, somewhere in Russia, I think. Um, but there are very interesting and uh, valuable uh, uh, Russian churches. But this one by Filippo Juvara, this one, I'm talking about this one, could have been, could have been built there. Well, it was not built there, it was built in Messina. It's a little jewel. Let's call it this way, a little jewel. But this one, I think, was affected by, uh, by the war uh, also or something, because I, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> and uh, you can see, nevertheless, and look at the interior. This is almost a Byzantine interior. It's so ornate and so, in a way, heavy, but interesting. And uh, I like this church very much. Rather unexpected. What is this? Uh, you see Filippo Juvara. Here I see that the word Juvara is written with just one R. In uh, my research, so to speak, we always had two R's. Um, very interesting church. Messina, Filippo Juvara. Yes, it was affected by um, probably war or who knows, the passage of time, could it be? That could be too. Yeah, we see uh, these were two books on Juvara, or is it, a, yeah, maybe the same book, the two covers of the book, Architetto de Savoia, Architecto in Europa, maybe two volumes uh, on him, with two of his drawings. Now, Quartieri Militari in Turin, interesting buildings from 1716 to 1728 so the beginning of the um, the, uh, the 18th century here they are uh, you know and maybe maybe they look a little bit militaristic but i think they are impressive as, as architectures as, as buildings i think they are museums now because everything becomes a museum you know uh, these days and uh, it's, it's a cultural um, zone into it with these buildings. Here are the plans, you know, symmetrical uh, two buildings. Um, interesting urban situation. I think I have a picture. I like this again, old pictures. You know, it's, it's, it's fine because you also don't see cars and you just contemplate the buildings and the, the you know, the, the beauty of the constructive method and the bricks and some of the old pictures, the old photographs done with much less technology, I mean, with a different technology than us, we, than the one you, we use. Um, sometimes uh, the photographs are excellent. I mean, the level of detail, like even here, um, and they have an atmosphere somehow, or maybe I'm just, uh, fantasizing nostalgically. Another old picture of the military uh, buildings uh, built by Juvara in Turin. And I have one, if I remember, also with a tree. Yes, with two trees. Look at this. But look, look at the urban space without cars. Uh, maybe Kenneth Frampton was right when he said the car destroyed the city. Uh, you know. <laughs> 
I, I think most most cities of the world without cars would, would be um, big surprises for, for most people. Another, I would say a beautiful picture, romantically uh, speaking. And, and here we have it, you know, with people at the top and with cars, mostly cars at the bottom. Filippo Juvara. In Turin. The sketch of the master. That's it. So um, that's it for today. Thank you.